Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing uh, the endothelium-derived relaxation factor. So, so far we've seen that when we uh, give an intravenous injection of acetylcholine, it's going to trigger the endothelial cells to uh, release nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is going to diffuse across the cell membrane of the endothelial cells back into the smooth muscle cells which surround uh, the uh, endothelium of the blood vessel. And it's going to there activate a soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme, which is going to start converting uh, GTP, guanosine triphosphate, into cyclic GMP and pyrophosphate. Uh, the cyclic GMP is then going to activate this cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase, which is also by the name of protein kinase G. Okay, so we now want to see why does protein kinase C uh, ha produce a um, relaxation of this smooth muscle cell. And in order to do that, we need to look uh, again at um, how a smooth muscle cell contracts. So I'll start basically with, by looking at the structure of a smooth muscle cell, and then we'll have a brief um, chat about uh, contraction of a smooth muscle cell. So if we have a smooth muscle cell here, I'll draw another picture because I don't want to ruin that one up there. Smooth muscle cells are called smooth muscle cells because they don't have any striations, okay? And the reason they don't have any striations is that the contractile units, uh, which are these actin filaments overlapping with these myosin filaments, they're not sort of aligned in a perfect order. So you don't sort of get the uh, combining of all of their patterns together to give you a macroscopic, well, not a macroscopic, but a pattern that you can see and discern down the microscope, down a, with a light microscope, the amazing thing. You don't need an electron microscope. With a light microscope, you can see the striations of a skeletal muscle cell. Smooth muscle cells, you can't. And the reason you can't is because the contractile units are not all orderly arranged. Uh, instead, what you have in the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell, you have lots of these structures which are known as dense bodies. Okay, so these, these um, circles that I'm drawing here these represent dense bodies, okay? And in addition to the dense bodies in the cytoplasm, you also have uh, proteins in the, um, in the membrane of the smooth muscle cell known as attachment plaques. So I'll show these here. So this is an attachment plaque. And basically what's going to happen is that um, the contractile units in the smooth muscle cell are going to be suspended between the dense bodies and uh, the dense bodies and attachment plaques as well. So basically, if I draw one of these uh, contractile um, units, I'll draw it between these two dense bodies. They've got a, 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 they're nicely positioned for it to be drawn. So basically, each of these dense bodies has actin filaments coming off it, basically, like so. Again, I'll just draw free because it means the picture will be easier on the eye, okay? And then what you have is a proteinaceous disc in the middle off which the myosin filaments come off. So the myosin filaments then overlap with these actin filaments that are coming from the dense bodies, and that makes a contractile unit, okay? So let me just highlight the different, um, the different filaments in different colours. So in green, we have these actin filaments, like so. Okay, and then we'll have in another colour, maybe blue, uh, or what colour will show up? Probably best pink, maybe. In pink, we'll then have the myosin filaments. So these are the myosin filaments overlapping with the actin there. Okay, and that's a contractile unit in a skeletal muscle cell. And now you'll have contractile units, which I'll just now show as boxes, suspended between loads of different dense bodies. So maybe another contractile unit here. Right, and I'll show these in a colour rather than just in black and white. So these orange boxes represent basically all of that, but I'm just too lazy to draw them again. So we'll have another one here, another one here maybe, and you'll get this basic huge great meshwork of these contractile units linking up basically the dense bodies and the attachment plaques and everything like that. Okay, so if... Um, if calcium goes up in the 
cytoplasm of this um, smooth muscle cell, which it will do in response to acetylcholine stimulation. So these smooth muscle cells have M3 muscarinic receptors on their surface, exactly like um, the uh, receptors that the endothelial cells have, okay? So they have M3 receptors on as well. Now, we gave an intravenous dose of acetylcholine. The acetylcholine gets to the endothelial cells, but it doesn't get to the uh, smooth muscle cells, basically. So they're not going to see this acetylcholine. Instead, they're only seeing the nitric oxide that's been produced by the endothelial cells in response to acetylcholine. And indeed, this is the basis of the acetylcholine paradox, which we'll discuss afterwards. Okay, so if you stimulate these muscarinic free receptors here uh, with acetylcholine, it causes basically calcium wave like signaling, just like we get in the endothelial cells. And just like we get in the endothelial cells, again, the calcium spikes are going to mean that calcium can then bind to calmodulin, so you get um, you get calcium calmodulin complexes forming in the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell. Now, these calcium calmodulin complexes can activate in skeletal muscle, oh, sorry, in smooth muscle cells. So let's say this is a calcium calmodulin complex here. It can activate an enzyme known as myosin light chain kinase. Okay, so this is myosin light chain kinase. So I'll write its name down here. So this is myosin light chain, whoops, light chain kinase often abbreviated to MLCK, so MLCK stands for myosin light chain kinase, and we'll draw this enzyme in purple. Now, basically, when calcium calmodulin complexes come and bind to myosin light chain kinase within the uh, smooth muscle cell, because, for instance, it's been stimulated uh, by acetylcholine acting on its M3 receptors, uh, it's going to activate these myosin light chain kinase enzymes, and those are going to um, phosphorylate the myosin heads, and that phosphorylation of the myosin heads then allows um, then allows um, what well, allows cross bridge cycling to begin. So it allows these contractile units basically to contract. So basically, when the myosin heads get phosphorylated these contractile units are going to start contracting and the smooth muscle cell will contract. So, if we're going to look at how protein kinase G is going to prevent contraction and cause relaxation, then we need to somehow stop the myosin heads being phosphorylated. Now, the, there are many ways that protein kinase G does this. Firstly, it's going to phosphorylate an enzyme, which I'll draw here, known as myosin light chain phosphatase. Okay, so this enzyme here is called myosin light chain phosphatase, and you might be able to guess what the job of this enzyme is going to be. It's going to chop off those phosphate groups that myosin light chain kinase adds on to the myosin heads, and thereby inactivate the myosin heads, so this is phosphatase and thereby inactivate the, um, the myosin heads and stop cross-bridge cycling, thereby stopping contraction of um, the, um, well, the contractile units of the smooth muscle cell and causing relaxation. So, protein kinase G is going to activate myosin light chain kinase, which is going to dephosphorylate these myosin light chain heads, and since the phosphorylation of the myosin light chain, or, well, the myosin light chain is the myosin head, since the dephosphorylation of the myosin head stops it from cross-bridge cycling, that's going to produce relaxation of the muscle cell. So that's one of the ways in which protein kinase G activates a relaxation of uh, the um, smooth muscle cell. In addition, uh, protein kinase G can also take steps to reduce uh, the uh, calcium signal within this smooth muscle cell. So, for instance, it can phosphorylate both the IP3 receptor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and also the circa pump. So, let's draw the sarcoplasmic reticulum here. Okay, so here's the IP3 receptor here, and here's the circa pump here. Now, 
um, protein kinase G can phosphorylate and inactivate the IP3 receptor, thereby stopping the release of, well, reducing the release of calcium from uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum lumen, basically. It can also phosphorylate and activate the circa pump here. So this is the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase that we saw uh, earlier in endothelial cells, but now it's also in these smooth muscle cells. Uh, and this is the IP3 receptor here. Okay, uh, so by phosphorylating and activating circa, you're going to ensure that circa pumps more calcium back into the SR. So again, these are both steps that are going to help kill the calcium signal. Since the calcium signal was important for activating the myosin light chain kinase, because it was important for creating these calcium calmodulin complexes here, which could then bind to the uh, myosin light chain kinase and activate it, then by, um, by inhibiting the IP3 receptor and uh, increasing the activity of the circa pump, you are decreasing the activity of the myosin light chain kinase enzyme. And therefore, you're activating the myosin light chain phosphatase, inactivating the myosin light chain kinase. So overall, that's going to tip the equilibrium, basically, and reduce the number of myosin heads that are phosphorylated, and therefore reduce uh, the number of crossbridge cycles happening, and therefore reduce the contraction of this smooth muscle cell, thereby producing relaxation. So, that is the way that uh, the endothelium-derived relaxation factor produces relaxation of the smooth muscle cells surrounding uh, the uh, endothelium of a blood vessel. It acti activates the myosin light chain phosphatase and takes steps which help kill the calcium signal and therefore kill uh, the stimulation of the myosin light chain kinase and therefore you reduce the cross bridge cycling that's occurring in those uh, smooth muscle cells and reduce the contraction of that smooth muscle cell. Okay, so that's how you produce relaxation. In the net, actually we'll discuss now in this video, we'll discuss acetal the acetylcholine paradox. So it's quite simple, we're in a perfect position now to understand the acetylcholine paradox. Basically, what was observed is that if you inject acetylcholine into someone, it causes major hypotension. So I'll write that word down. Hypotension is just a fancy word meaning low blood pressure. Okay, and the reason it caused hypertension was um, because um, it had caused the dilatation of all the blood vessels in the way that we've just seen. So it activates the endothelial cells to produce nitric oxide, Nitric oxide diffuses into the smooth muscle there of the blood vessel and uh, activates the soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme. That produces cyclic GMP, which then activates protein kinase G. Protein kinase G uh, activates myosin light chain phosphatase, uh, inactivates the IP3 receptor, activates circa. That means that the calcium signal is reduced, which inactivates the myosin light chain kinase. So overall, it's going to reduce the phosphorylation of the myosin light chains, or the myosin heads, and therefore reduce the contraction of the smooth muscle, producing relaxation. Okay, so that's why it produced hypertension. If the blood vessels all dilatate, uh, then um, you've got the same amount of blood in a smaller volume, in essence, and uh, the pressure on the side of the blood vessel walls is going to be reduced. That's one reason. Also, it's slightly more complicated than that because um, you're reducing the total peripheral resistance and therefore increasing venous return, basically. Um, so it's going to cause hypotension, basically, but uh, because of uh, vasodilatation of the blood vessels. Now, um, if, um, if instead you take the smooth muscle, well, if, if instead you take the actual uh, blood vessel out of the body and try and stimulate it with acetylcholine, what you find is that it contracts the blood vessel. And that was a paradox. How could it um, dilate the blood vessel in vivo and then in vitro 
uh, contract the blood vessel. And the reason was that in vivo, the acetylcholine never gets to these M3 receptors on the actual smooth muscle cells. Instead, it only activates the M3 receptors on the endothelium, thereby, thereby activating them to produce nitric oxide and produce relaxation of the smooth muscle cell. If instead you actually put the acetylcholine on the smooth muscle cells directly, it causes them to contract because it's going to um, cause a calcium signal, calcium waves within these uh, smooth muscle cells, uh, and therefore cause contraction of that smooth muscle cell um, by activating these myosin-like chain kinases. So that's the acetylcholine paradox. In the next video, what I want to do is talk to you uh, about uh, superfusion.